Dopey Podcast Dopey Podcast Well dopey now podcast. is the time for the Dopey Podcast, dopey podcast. When you call in and dopey put podcast. all your life on blast And you call dopey in podcast. and talk about your past Because your dopey life was podcast. curious, hardcore and fast So dopey now podcast. is the time for the Dopey Podcast Dopey Podcast It's the Dopey Podcast The Dopey, dopey podcast. podcast, yo This is the Dopey Podcast This is the Dopey Podcast Now if your life was pure, just hardcore and fast You feel like you want to put your life on blast Just call up the show and I talk about your past Cause now is the time for the Dopey Podcast Dopey Podcast It's the Dopey Podcast The Dopey, dopey podcast. podcast, yo This is the Dopey Podcast This is the Dopey Podcast This episode of Dopey is brought to you by our friends at Aloe Recovery Located in sunny Southern California in Malibu and Silver Lake Aloe was created by our friend Bob Forrest and his friend Evan Haynes And their friend Bob to create a facility, a program that helps drug addicts get clean In a comfortable setting that is all about compassion and not control Bob had been a part of a million treatments as a patient and as a facilitator, and he decided that he didn't like what he saw, so he made something that he thought would work where addicts get a compassionate treatment and they get treated with respect, which is a great thing. They also make sure that if you're fucking hooked to the gills on heroin or pills or alcohol, that your detox is comfortable, which I always like, and they treat co-occurring mental health disorders like severe mental illness and others. Um... I'd go there. Their fucking facilities are top notch. The amenities include surfing, sweat lodges, sound bath meditations. If you're fucked and you have nowhere else to go and you don't know what to do and you've always wanted to go to California, you should go to Aloe. This episode of Dopey is also brought to you by listeners like you in the Dopey Nation. Your generous support helps the show function. Go to www.patreon.com slash dopeypodcast if you want to give money. Give a dollar if you want. Give two. Give $675 a month if you got it. That would be awesome. But I understand. That's crazy. Don't give that. Give whatever you can. And if you don't want to give anything, don't give anything. We need you, not your money. If you want hats, Venmo me, stickers, same thing. If you want t-shirts, uh, go to www.dopeypodcast.com. Enough with the ads already. Here is the fucking show. Welcome to Dopey, the podcast about drugs, addiction, and dumb shit, and I am Dave. And before we start the show, I mean, we did the ads, and we say before we start the show, and we do the ads, but now before we start the show, I just want to congratulate everyone in the Dopey Nation for beating the motherfuckers at iTunes. So let's give yourselves a round of applause and a vape knock. If you have a vape, I have a salt shaker, so I'm going to knock the salt shaker against the table. And I don't know that the people at iTunes are motherfuckers. I just like to say that. Uh, Basically, Dopey was up, and then Dopey was down, and then we launched the hardcore power to the people Dopey email writing campaign, and Dopey is back. So thank everybody. Thank you guys very much for writing the emails. I love that. I I was kind of hoping that we'd be off iTunes for a little while longer so I could just go nuts with it. But... I'm very, very happy we're back on iTunes. All right, we have a very, very special show coming up. But before we do, I just want to give you a nice little message from our new sponsor at Blue Chew. Do you like sex? If you like sex, you'll love BlueChew.com. Blue Chew offers men a performance enhancement for the bedroom. Wouldn't you like to last longer and go extra rounds? At BlueChew.com, you get the first chewables with the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis. Chewables can work faster than pills, up to twice as fast. 
The chewables from Blue Chew can be taken on a full or empty stomach. It only takes a few minutes to get uh, in contact with the BlueChew.com affiliated physician. And if you get qualified, you get prescribed online quickly. So no in-person doctor visit, no awkward conversation, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. They ship directly to your door in a very, very discreet package, a package that does not say it is BlueChew.com. Anyway... Blue Chew will give you confidence in bed every time, and you and your partner will love it. Now, most important, there's a free deal for you guys. You visit BlueChew.com and get your first order for free when you use promo code DOPEY. Just pay $5 shipping. That's B-L-U-E-C-H-E-W.com, promo code DOPEY. Order it. Get the free Blue Chew while you can. Yeah, Blue Chew's free. Get them because they're free. Who knows how long this offer can last. Just use the promo code DOPEY. So if you want to get Blue Chew, you should get it now because it's fucking free. Use promo code DOPEY and get the Blue Chew. And this week, we had the distinct pleasure of talking with one of America's premier drag performers, Alaska Thunderfuck. She was a total delight. She actually came in second on RuPaul's all-star drag race, and she came in fifth on RuPaul's drag race. But she's very funny and cool and honest, and uh, here she is, Alaska Thunderfuck. All right, everybody. Uh, We've had some big guests on the show before, but I think this one might have the biggest following we've ever had on the show, which is super drag queen extraordinaire Alaska Thunderfuck. Welcome to the show. Hi, uh... I was just telling you um, that I I was um, listening to an episode. I I didn't really know what to expect with um, with this podcast because I don't know. Sometimes with podcasts, you never really know what uh, what to expect. And so I downloaded one and I listened to it. And I was like. And I, I started listening to it, and I was like, oh, my God, it's 97 minutes long. Like, is this going to be just one of those meandering podcasts with no structure that, like, I just, I can't imagine why anyone would listen to it, which there are podcasts like that out there. Yeah, I figure ours is kind of um, like one of them. <laughs> no, but that's the thing. Like, I started listening. I was like, oh, my God, this is, like, lit. This is so good. Uh, which one did you listen to? I thank you, by the way. Thank you. That makes me happy. But which one did you listen to? I was I was listening to the one with the guy from Gawker. Ah, uh, AJ Delirio. All right, cool. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you liked it. That's fucking yeah. awesome. Now, but we're not going to talk about me. Cause well, people are giving me a hard time that I talk about me too much on the podcast. And you're fucking Alaska, well, Alaska I, Thunderfuck. And we should talk about you. Because you're, you've you called in. That's fine. Which I think is not. I mean, I'd like to hear more nice things. I love to hear nice things about me. So if you want to just say a few, <laughs> we'll get it out of the way if you want. Okay. Okay, sure. <laughs> Um, well, I just want to, I mean, I just want to like in full disclosure and I don't like, I, um, have a relationship with sobriety, but I'm in no way like, like in the program, I've never been to a meeting. Like I don't like, I'm not, I'm not particularly clean and sober right now in my life. And so, like, I don't know if that, like, makes me ineligible to be a guest on your podcast. No, you wouldn't be the first person who isn't clean and sober to come on the podcast. That's for sure. So, and just the fact that you want to have full disclosure, I think, is a great place to start. Uh, I think, you know, the the best thing about the show is when it's honest, and it sounds like you want to be honest. You came to us, um, you know, through this guy, Ken, who I guess is your agent, right? Manager? What does he do? He's my, he's my publicist. Nice. <laughs> I don't have a fucking publicist. My, I have an agent. I never told the audience about it. I have an agent who doesn't do anything. I need a manager, I think. Anyway. Um, okay. So, Ken, but, but when I originally started reading about you, one of the things I read about you was said that you had gotten sober. Did you, had you gotten sober? I did. Um, and it was... It was several years ago now, but I I was sober for like two and a half years um, because it was just sort of 
things were getting out of hand and like my career was starting to take off and it was it was sort of a turning point and I was like okay I can either like be serious about this thing or I can just like let it fizzle out and just do what I've been doing right um now Um, prior prior to that like what was the rise of your career like and like what was the uh intoxication level that made you have that kind of revelation well, have you heard of RuPaul's Drag Race? Are you kidding me? I'm sitting here fucking cramming for the Alaska Thunderfuck fucking interview all day. I'm watching RuPaul. I'm watching your videos. I'm watching you do stand-up. I'm, I'm like up to my ankles in fucking Alaska, or up to my knees. Maybe even up to my neck in Alaskan Thunderfuck lore. And that was where I wanted to start, actually. Where did you get the name Alaska okay. Thunderfuck? Well, uh, marijuana that, actually. Do you? What do you? Have you ever smoked Alaska Thunderfuck? Yes, I have. It's very nice. And something I just learned about it recently is that um, it's kind of an unusual strain because it can't be grown indoors. It has. It's a, it's like a wild plant and has to be grown outdoors. So I it's actually very, like hardy and. I actually Googled it. You want me to read you? You want me to read you the the description of what is Alaskan Thunderfuck? Please do. I feel like it's way more risk scope or something. No, you can you can comment and see how much it really describes you because I mean I'm sure you didn't pick it because okay. you you knew all of these incredible facts about the strain in the first place. But here, Alaska. No, I just thought it sounded cool. It does. Um, Alaskan yeah. Thunderfuck, also referred to as ATF. Matanuska Thunderfuck or Matanuska Tundra is a legendary sativa dominant strain originating in the Matanuska area of Alaska. According to the legend, it was originally a Northern California sativa crossed with a Russian Ruderalis, but sometime in the late 70s it was crossed with Afghani genetics to make it hardier. Alaska Thunderfuck usually presents large, beautifully frosted buds with incredibly strong odors of pine, lemon, menthol, and skunk. Known for possessing a relaxing yet intensely euphoric high, it is also described as having a creeper effect. So, what do you think? Do you think that describes you well? Oh, I love that. Oh, it's weird. I I used to be such a fucking stoner. This is from a website called Leafly, and it, like describes every strain of bud. Do you smoke bud still? I do. I've actually been kind of like kind of more into whoa, why am I echoing? Okay. Um, I've been more into like cannabis lately uh, in general. I like it. Let's get, I, I used to love Is that it. bad? Listen, I'm not here to judge I you. I feel like well, I feel like um, your podcast is like a space for like people in recovery and like sober people. So I don't want to like, I just, I kind of feel, I don't know. I, I don't want to be like, yeah, like I love drinking wine and I love smoking weed and like, I have no problems. Like I don't, I just, I don't want to be like harmful. Well, the to- truth is that anybody, anybody that got sober loved you know, I, I never liked drinking wine so much, but I loved taking pills and shooting heroin and smoking pot. Uh, but my life got all fucked up. You know, it wasn't good. And I'm sure you didn't seek yeah. sobriety because your life was perfect, right? No, yeah, no. Far from that. So when you came up uh, on you yeah. came up on that RuPaul show on the RuPaul Drag Race. Can you, am right, I echoing? Yeah. Are you echoing? Is it a bad connection? Are you struggling with this? No, it sounds fine now. Okay, good. So, so tell me about like what what it was like getting famous, getting well known. Like, what was that like? It was not really what we expected, and I say we because it was, I it was my my boyfriend at the time, we were together for four years and we both sort of auditioned for drag race and, and he got on and I didn't. And so that was kind of crazy. He went on to be like, that was the super dopey named uh, Sharon needles. 
<laughs> yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, continue. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah, she went on the show and she won and, you know, was sort of shot to, like, meteoric success for a, a Rue girl, for a drag race contestant. It, before her, that had never really been a thing. And so she sort of, like, I don't know, it was really huge and it, it really changed our lives. And then the next year I went on and I made it to the final three and I didn't win. And um, and then our relationship sort of started to fall apart because we were, we were on the road and going different places. And then uh, we were, we had money all of a sudden. So Coke was like, oh, wow, like, we're rich now. Like, we can buy Coke. We could never get it before because we were, we were too poor. Right. So we sort of just had, like, the floodgates sort of open because we were, like, counting our fucking tip money from, you know, he was making coffee and I was making $10 an hour working in a boutique and we would scrape together our money to buy a 12-pack and, and that was great. And then all of a sudden, the floodgates open and like, oh, fuck, like now we're now we have money. So it just became like what it just escalated, like our drinking and definitely Coke usage <laughs> escalated. So drinking and Coke were the number one things. I'm sure you smoked weed at the time, too. A little bit. But, like, that probably would have balanced me out. But I wasn't smoking weed very much. It was very, like, it was very um, cocaine moment. And then I was, like, and it was during that time period that I I discovered what a panic attack is. And I it makes sense, you know, looking back now, because we were doing coke a lot, and then, like, that raises your heart rate and makes you... So I thought I was having a heart attack, but that's, like, the exact symptom of... Right. Of, like, an anxiety attack. Right, right. And so I was, like... I was, like, freaking... It was during that time period I, I realized what an anxiety attack is. So, you know, you're, you're, like, on top of the world, basically, you know, uh, you and, and Sharon... You know, young, beautiful drag queens fucking making a fortune of money, doing coke, drinking. And that was before you won the All-Star, RuPaul All-Stars number two, right? This was like the kind of the climbing of uh, Alaska Thunderfuck to, to Providence. Prominence. Not Providence. Prominence. I was just in Providence this weekend. It was really fun. In Prominence, yeah, in Providence. Right. Good. Continue. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. What I want, yeah, what I want to know is like, what, what was, what, what went wrong? You know, I mean, I understand. Like, what was the moment that you knew you had to change, and then how did you change? Well, uh, let's see if we can pinpoint it. I mean, it didn't help that. Um, I think. Oh my God! Whoa, there's so many. Okay, um, the one of the things that was like sort of the beginning of the end of our relationship was I went to Florida. I had a gig there and I got wasted on good. At this point I had started asking the promoters to get Coke for me, like it in the car from the airport, like just, you know, bringing it up in conversation, like, Oh, wouldn't it be crazy if we had Coke? Like that'd be so not. <laughs> and some promoters would be like, yeah, no, but some would be like, oh, fuck yeah, we can make that happen because they want to impress the, the drag queen from TV from out of town. Um, so that had been like becoming like a regular thing. And girl, I was in Miami and Miami was the city where uh, Coke was available. And... So I got wasted and I was on coke and the show was fucking horrible. I, I didn't do a good job. And I ended up taking somebody home to the hotel room and um, and becoming unfaithful to my 
partner, which I had never done right. in four years. Um, and that just sort of, then it was like, it was a secret that I was keeping and that sort of started to eat away and like drive a wedge between us. And then like, I would just get wasted and do more drugs to like make me not think about this thing that I didn't want to tell my partner. Right. You were feeling like shame and guilt that you had cheated on her and like just wanted not to think about it. So you kept using. Yep. Yeah, that yeah. was the vibe. Now, but I mean, little did I know that she had she had another, you know, she had another boyfriend already, <laughs> and so she was sort of. I think she was waiting for me to to bring it up or me to bring up like my slip ups, so that you know it would just be sort of even Stevens and we could just move on. And it could, we could break up, but it wasn't, it wasn't really a clean break. It got really ugly and another Coke fueled, uh, uh, whiskey fueled night happened at our house. And that was like the end because we got physical and, um, and, um, I, I banged her head into a coffee table and it could have gotten, it could have been really, really bad. Like I could have got in jail and well, what happened after that you smashed her head into the coffee table yeah and what? then i was like okay i have to go and i left and i never came back i never went back like we're friends now but it, that was like the the absolute end of end of the relationship and so it was it was in that time where I was like, I don't know where, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I don't know. I, I need to like figure out what my next step is. I was planning on moving to LA to be far away from her. And so that was sort of the time period where, uh, Michelle Visage was really a mentor and, and was sort of like, you know, you can like, clean up your fucking act right. and continue to work in a prosperous, successful way, or you can keep doing what you're doing and being a fuck up. And sorry, hold on one second. Hi, how are you? Oh, thanks. How's it Thank going? You so much. Oh yeah, of course. Have a good night. All right, you Where are you? I'm at home. That was my um, postmate delivery of Chipotle. Nice. Very good. Very good. Anyway, um, so she said you can either yeah. fucking fuck it all up or you can get your shit together. And you were feeling like, I mean, you must have been feeling like you were on the precipice of greatness. I'm sure, like, as a, you know, you as a young person, you always imagined being famous and being fabulous. And, like, here all your dreams were coming true, right? Yeah. <laughs> And I guess that's, I mean, isn't that the nature of, of like addiction is like you, you can sort of, even if you can have everything that you want, like you will literally push that aside just to get to that, that substance or that thing. Well, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting, what it was like for me. One one of the things they talk about, and I'm sure you heard it talked about if you were clean for two and a half years or something, where they talk about why we drink or why we use, you know, because we're not comfortable in our own skin, you know, like that sort of thing. And it kind of reminded me of the phenomenon of coming out or what I've read about coming out because I never came out. Do you see any parallel between the two things or no? Well, I always wondered... Or and sometimes I I still wonder because you know um, I mean I still I I still drink a lot like I reach I reach for it you know and I know that it is a coping mechanism for me and it's not like I'm not going out and wrecking cars or losing jobs because of it. I don't drink before I go on stage like all these things but it's still like there's still a it's still in my life, like as that, you know, specter. And so I I think of what is my wound or what is my pain 
and why I feel the need to go for that. And I don't know. I mean, I theorized about it. I've thought about it. Um, I don't know for, I thought like maybe I'm, maybe I'm a woman and I've been suppressing it for all these years, but I, I sort of ruled that out because they, I realized that that's not the case of my journey. Right. Um, I think it comes from maybe it has something to do with like not feeling good enough or not feeling like worthy inherently. Yeah. I mean, um, self-esteem stuff you mean yeah um what was it like yeah because you said you never went to meetings you never like had a program whatever but you got a, a couple years sober so how did you do it you just just gave yeah. it up well our household i mean me and sharon our household was very much a drinking household and so when i moved out it it was surprisingly not easy and or it was surprisingly not hard because I was like, I was like, I was sort of fueled by anger at her. And so I was sort of do part of it was like, well, we were fucking drinking buddies. So this is my way of like not being with her, you know? It's like, and fuck like, you. Actively. I don't even need to drink. I don't need to be with you. And I don't need to be, and, and I don't need to drink. It was. There was definitely there was definitely that going on. And then I started to see, I don't know, just like, I don't know. I started to see positive things happen in my life and in my career. And, and so I, you know, I stuck with that. Were you sober when you won the all-star uh, RuPaul drag race number two, whatever it is? No, I was not. And and the thing that and like now I've come to terms with where I'm at and like like I'm chill and I'm honest and I'm able to talk about it, you know, without shame or, you know, without lying or or uh, using clever language to like skirt around it. But at that time, it was sort of public that I was sober. Right. But I was not. I was. I was drinking. Uh, started out with just like a little. Uh, then it was like I was filming All Stars and I would sort of like, I was being really careful about who saw because Michelle Visage is a judge on Drag Race. She was my main person that was like championing me being sober. She was there judging the contest. I was not sober, but I wanted to win, so I wanted to not let anyone working on the production know that I was drinking, which, like, that sort of secret keeping and, like, that's, that's some shit right there. Right. Which, uh, which I, don't, I don't like and I, I, I don't want to do with anything. Yeah, double life stuff. Dishonesty. Yeah. So I was struggling with that. And it, it was even like after, after all that happened and, and like Michelle put me in her book and like, it was an anecdote in her book that was like, it was like, basically, I think it was the last page of the book. Like it was a really serious, like touching moment where she was like, basically like, and I helped Alaska get sober and like Alaska has a bright future ahead of her. And I was like, so I was feeling like ashamed of that. I didn't keep it up for her. Right. So I was like dealing with all of that. All that stuff happened around all stars too. And like, yes, it looked like I was getting a crown on my head and like, that's supposed to be the biggest, most happiest moment of my life. But like I was dealing with some, fucking weird shit at that time just shame and you didn't know like like who you were or like who knew who you actually were and there were these ideas about you out there and stuff yes now when you were yeah. when you were when you were like abstaining like do you remember the first drink when you came back to it like what was that what was that experience like i had started dating someone and he 
was a sommelier. Okay. <laughs> he was a wine expert. Right. He was like taking courses and classes to be a wine expert, which is this like, I mean, is that like, is that like the devil, like literally tempting me? Like, what is that? It's cruel irony. We'll call it, we'll call it cruel irony. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I remember we went out, we went out for a really fancy meal and I was like, I can have a glass of fancy wine. Like he's yeah. buying me this really fancy dinner and he's a wine expert and like, what? I'll have a glass of red wine, like big deal. And so then that, that sort of cracked the door open and then it was like, oh, well, let's just keep wine in the house. Like just, you know, just for when we're at home or whatever. And then like, you know, <laughs> that was, that was. well, the truth is though, the truth is that nobody needs to be sober you know what I mean? It's not, it's like, like my wife isn't sober. Like a lot of my friends aren't sober. If your life is good, then, then do what makes you happy. You know, when we started recording Dopey, that was one of the first things we said. If you're doing drugs, enjoy them. You know what I mean? Like, it's just if you can't enjoy yeah. them and if your life fucking spins out of control. And I know that, you know, I was never a drinker, so I, I don't know what would happen if I drank a glass of wine. I would probably wind up being able to uh, smoke weed and, and if I smoked weed, I would smoke weed every day. And if I was smoking weed every day, I might start taking benzos. And if I might start taking benzos, I might start taking opiates too. I mean, for me, I'm a, I'm a drug addict, you know, and I, I wind up descending down this path once I put something in my body. You know, that, that might not be the yeah. case for you. And if it is the case, you know, you know how to take precautions. I mean, and if you don't know how to take precautions, you can always call me. I'm always happy to help. Thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate it. But do you understand my point? It's like it it's like there's no judgment. It's like it's all about the quality of your life and, and how is the quality of your life? The quality of my life is good. Uh, I'm in a happy relationship and um I'm uh working and uh I'm grateful and so it's it's good. Do you have any, um, cause I've been like, I, I heard a story, there was some story about you getting kicked out of some bar called Mickey's or something. Is that, is that some, <laughs> some important story in your, in your earlier sobriety or no? Well, part of your, that, I mean, that wasn't even early sobriety. That was like a few years, like a couple of years ago. Uh, that, that wasn't like early using days. So I was. Ken told me that um, your podcast is like a lot of it is like telling like stories of you know, disastrous, you know, drug use or whatever. Yes. Um, well, um, this is definitely one of those nights. And I hadn't eaten dinner for whatever reason. I don't know what I was thinking. I Maybe I was trying to like be thinner at the time, which... Um, is dumb because I, I if I get any thinner, I will literally disappear. But it was like I, I just was like, no, it's fine. I'm not gonna eat dinner. And then I was like drinking wine and whiskey at dinner. And then I was like, kind of, kind of drunk. So I was like, let's go to the Mickey. Let's go to the bar. Let's go to Mickey's in West Hollywood, where I continued to drink whiskey and wine. And I was buying shots for everybody and just um, carrying on. Broke, in, broke into the dressing room, harassing the girls, um, uh, being a, a red-faced uh, menace. And then... Uh, Were you in drag? Yeah, got, Were you well, in drag now, that night? No, I was not in drag. Okay. I was uh, in, in nice shoes and a blazer. Okay. But um, just being sort of a drunk terror. And so the next day I woke up, and are you familiar with... Um, are you familiar with Boys in the Band, the um, play, uh, like not, stage play? Not familiar enough to know anything of it. I think I've heard the name before. Well, it's like a seminal, like, gay, like, play. Okay. It was like one of the first like, popular plays about gay men. And so one of the characters has this monologue, and he's, like, talking about, you know, 
getting drunk and like why he gets drunk and why he uses drugs because he's like he, it's something about like you you start and then like you say something rude and then you feel shitty about that you feel icky, the icky feeling about that and so then you wake up the next day and you realize what you did and so you drink again because you feel that icky feeling and you keep doing it so because of that right so it's like a cycle it's something like that the monologue's really good i i don't i'm paraphrasing deeply but it was very like i woke up the next day and i was like oh fuck like this was an this was an icky night that i just had and i knew it was bad because my boyfriend was like I need to come over on my lunch break from work and we have to talk. And I was like, oh, fuck, he's never done that before. This is, this is serious. Um, and uh, we had a discussion about it. And I just, I felt generally shitty about it. And so I was like, I can either... I can either just pretend this never happened and just try to move on or I can make something out of it to make this night that was kind of disastrous somewhat worthwhile. So I wrote a song about it and it's called Getting Kicked Out of Mickey's on a Monday Night and it's on my new album and it's a really good song. So I'm glad that I at least got something good out of that. So this is a good, this is a good segue to promote Vagina, your new record. On feminism. And oh, I know. <laughs> what else happened that night? Like, what did you do exactly that made them kick you out? Like, do you remember any of the, of the sordid details? Well, I think... It, well, I remember... I know why my boyfriend was upset with me, because he... Uh, because I think I was, like, hitting on our friend, which was, like... <laughs> <laughs> and I was doing it right in front of my boyfriend, which was a little like, which is, you know, really inappropriate. Um, and that was sort of over the line for him. Why did I get kicked out? I don't even, I don't even know. I, I can't even fucking remember. My brother was there. Right. And From Bro Alaska. I, I was even. Yeah. Okay. Wow, you've done so much research. Yeah, I'm, yes, I'm totally. Um, I'm, an, I'm an expert over here. I love. Uh, um, my brother was there, and I barely remember even seeing him. But like, um, I was even too drunk that I was annoying him. So that's like really, you know, it's you know, it's bad because it's usually the other way around. Yeah, he seems like he might be a little bit annoying sometimes. <laughs> um my favorite thing that I came across in um in my uh research was you like doing this sort of like comedy thing and uh and you were talking about oh, your ex-girlfriend Sharon Needles and that you were at her house and I think it was just a bit will you do will you do that bit you know what I'm talking about right the band-aid bit <laughs> I was at I was at Sharon's house and uh, I like cut my finger on the doorway and I said, Sharon, do you have any band aids? And she said, No, I just have regular aids. I love That's that. Terrible. It's terrible, but I like that kind of stuff. Now, did Sharon Sharon Needles was not an IV drug user? It was just a clever, dangerous name, right? I don't think she. I don't think she was ever into needling anything um but she says that she likes the name sharon needles because it's how straight people get aids that's wow. what she said <laughs> wow that's fucking dark i like that you know i mean i, I mean that's one of I mean, very dark but that's like the the dangerous like i mean drag is such a weird thing because everybody loves it and it's so dark and so light at the same time like I, I agree. I, I just think it's fascinating. Like st- all, like so many straight men love love drag, but don't necessarily love gay people, and uh, and they don't necessarily love the inner workings of it. But there's something so hypnotic about seeing a man, you know, dressed as a woman. I think. What do you think it is? 
Well, uh, I mean, I think about this a lot, and I think at its core, drag is the worshipping of divine feminine energy. So there's like, there's, I see it, I mean, there, I have to see it as like a religious process almost, because there is a transformation that happens that takes like no less than two hours. And if I try to do it in less than that, then it just, it, it falls like a fucking souffle that it wasn't in the oven long enough. Right. So like there's a, there's a metaphysical something that happens. It creates something more, more than the sum of its parts. And it's really magic. There's like something magic to it and holy. And, um, and so like I respect drag immensely because of that. But, I mean, it's also, like, so it's very, that's very deep and spiritual, but I also like it because it is completely frivolous, and it's completely stupid, and I have, like, I have carte blanche to be ridiculous and not take, not take it seriously, and not take anything seriously, like clothes or gender assignment, which are things that people get killed over all the time. Right. It's like it's um, a it's a it's a strange arena for comedy in, in unexplored places because it's the absurd. It's total absurdity. Like that band aids joke, it's like it's total absurdity because obviously AIDS is a huge crisis, you know, in 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 the gay world in the straight world, and it's this you know yeah. macabre joke, and that's why it's even funnier, you know, which is what Dopey's about too. It's about laughing at the worst yeah. shit we did. Um, and I know that there, we've had a bunch of uh, every gay episode we ever had. I, we would call even gayer than. Well, first, it was the gayest dopey episode. Then it was even gayer than the gayest dopey episode. And <laughs> you know, and, and I think there was a lot of uh, gay sex stories, chem sex stories, you know, meth stories, you know, a, around the gay population. Like once there are there are drug addicts in the gay population, the stories get like pretty outlandish at times or at least i've heard some really crazy crazy stories and um and around the drag population is there a drug thing or is it not so much well i mean i think that meth is something that has a grip on our community in a huge way that's really fucking scary and like i'm glad that it's a path that i never went down because it really just, you see it happen. It, it takes like a grip on people and fucking sucks their fucking life out. And this is something that really affects the gay community. And so it's also, it's also similar with HIV and AIDS. It's like we, at our, our community, our people have dealt with some really fucking dark shit. Right. And so, so I think the, 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 humor that can go really fucking dark and really twisted i think it's like a healing thing it's like we if we don't laugh about it then you know we're just gonna weep exactly exactly so so like you see someone like lady bunny who just is making like these horrible jokes about you know whether it's drugs or whether it's aids or whether it's whatever it is She's doing it from a place of like love and healing. I, I, I believe that she is. All right, and and I'd imagine that um, that a drag queen who had a drug habit wouldn't last that long because we, you know, drug addicts look so shitty so quickly, and it would probably be very easy <laughs> to tell if somebody was a drug addict in the drag world. Is, is that the case? Uh, I don't know. Uh, cause I mean, the, the, I, I, I don't know. I would think that, but you know, some drag, some drag queens who have drug problems look fucking gorgeous. So oh, it's and they maintain very, like mysterious. Right. They maintain. That's what? amazing. Amazing. All right. Well, yeah. this has been very interesting and I do really, really appreciate you coming on. Um, what else? I, I one more question in terms of like your sobriety. Like, did you? It just doesn't sound like you regretted drinking again. Did did you, what did you like about being sober? 
Like, what was the ex- – like, when you talk about it or when you think about it, like, how do you reflect on it? Uh, well, when I was sober, I was definitely more productive and prolific. And I was sort of writing more and I – I had a lot more time on my hands. And so when you sort of take drinking off the table, it's like, oh my gosh, like I sort of doubled the time in my day. Right. Basically. And so I got a lot more done, <laughs> like a lot more work things done. But the the greatest thing about it was that I got to fall in love with performing again. And it was like, I, I went to college and I studied theater and I got to be on stage and acting and I would never touch a drink before going on stage because it's the theater and like there's so much going on and you have to be, you know, you have to be on top of it in order to be good at it. Or at least I did. And so when I started doing drag, I was like, we would just get wasted and then go on stage and do shows and, Um, so when I was sober for two and a half years, I got to like fall in love with like performing and doing drag and like, uh, and like really being there and being on stage. So that's something I've held on to. Like, I, I don't do fucking anything except black tea before I go on stage. Right. Because I need to have all my faculties available to me in order just to like, make it happen was that the inspiration for so that's like for what the song t wasn't that the song t or did Uh, i get that wrong the song with the big video i just watched hugely yeah it's hugely the the first line in it is i like black tea because it's true i'm like a freak when it comes to black tea the second line is i like black d right (laughs) <laughs> that's so, it's so offensive jesus christ yes that is the second line but that's why it's yeah. great and um but i do appreciate you coming <laughs> on uh obviously uh be in touch oh what can what can you plug do you want to plug anything while you're on well um i love uh i love podcasts and i actually have a podcast with my really good friend willem and we talk about uh, RuPaul's Drag Race and we also have like a sister show where we just talk about like what's going on in the world and um, politics and our lives um, so that's called Race Chaser with Alaska and Willem cool Race Chaser and you're going on tour right I am I'm going on tour really soon with my best friend Jeremy and we're singing some of our witchy woo woo prayers for a new earth songs uh called amethyst journey and we're doing that in yeah we're doing that in the uk and um a a few places in europe and we're doing that in july so there won't be much there won't be much black d talk on that amethyst journey tour i don't think so i mean that is important for like for awakening the planet but no probably not on that tour so much <laughs> but you, you never know so tell me you're gonna give the website i didn't mean to interrupt you can go to alaskathunderfuck.com and you can find out um what what where i'm gonna be next right on well thank you so much alaska i really appreciate your time it was awesome to have you on the show thank you so much um all right cool so be well and we'll be in touch maybe and we'll talk maybe that would be nice I think this is very exciting. You're okay, big. Cool. You're like a bit. You're big time. You've got millions of Instagram followers and Twitter followers and shit. People really care about what you it have to say about nothing. stuff. No, it means nothing. I mean, it's just such an arbitrary weird. Like, it's very. It, Instagram is such an arbitrary. Just, just. I don't know. It means nothing. Right. Well, know. you've got you've got a gigantic social media following, and your fans seem really into it. So that's got to be like satisfying in some way. Yeah, it's very satisfying because like we're really we're really grateful to to the kids who follow drag and respect drag and like I, like they they make it they make it really worthwhile to fucking to keep getting to do this. So I'm really grateful for them. All right, well, super cool. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate you coming on.
Thank you. Have a good day. You too. We'll talk soon. Bye. Bye. All right. That was Alaska Thunderfuck on the telephone, and I thought it was awesome that she came on. Uh, a drag performer of that caliber coming clean uh, is uh, is awesome. But I'm very, very, very excited because on the phone, straight from Paris, France, operating out of Los Angeles, California, uh, you remember her, you love her, it's Aurora. Welcome back. Hi, thank you. Hi, Dopey Nation. Good to be back. You think everybody remembers and loves you? Yes, for sure. For sure, for sure. To know you is to love you, and 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 I love you, and I'm happy you're back. So how are you doing, Roy? Uh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm back uh, from a month in Paris of work, which was amazing. And, yeah, I'm looking for my next gig, and I'm settling back into L.A. life. Now, before we get into the uncertainty of freelance life in recovery, um, yeah. I think it's it's astounding, you know, Aurora, if you don't know, she's a, a recovering alcoholic and drug addict, and she's from upstate New York, and she's lived in New York City for, how long did you live in New York City before you moved to L.A.? 13 years. Yeah, she lived in New York City for 13 years. She, she basically became a New Yorker in that time, I'll say it, and um, and then she moved to Los Angeles, seamlessly becoming a Los Angelino. So why don't what, what do you think? How, why do you like it so much out there? It, may, it offends me somehow that you like it so much in Los Angeles. <laughs> I just, you know, I like that I can see a lot of sky. I like that the vegetation is totally different than what I'm used to. I like the mountains. I like the ocean. Um, sometimes I like driving. Uh, I love that I have a big apartment that I can afford and live alone. That is one of the the best parts about living here. You know what it really is? It's a testimony to how you are. Because, like, you're just the kind of person you go someplace and you make it work. Wouldn't you say that's something that's true about you? Yeah, I think I am. I think you can drop me anywhere and I make it work. And I think I'm very fortunate in that way. And, you know, I think, like, when I was in Paris, like, I'm down to adventure and experience new things and talk to people and, you know, figure out how I get from point A to point B. And so I think that kind of openness and versatility, you know, makes it so I can get comfortable pretty quick in a new place. People always say like addicts are like that. You drop an addict someplace and they're going to have the connect all hooked up right away. Um, and I think that's true. Yeah. Um, and I know you went to a bunch of meetings in, in, in Gay Paris. Uh, what were the meetings like over there? Dude, I mean, I think anyone that's sober and wants to take a vacation, that Paris is a great place to go because the recovery is so good. I mean, every day there are three to eight different English-speaking meetings all over the city. And they're well-attended, The good recovery a lot of, um, you know, a mix of ethnicities and nationalities in the meetings, tons of people that are visiting there as tourists, people that come back to these meetings when they're in town for business or for pleasure. And then like a huge core group of, of all sorts of people, Americans, Brits, Irish, uh, French, um, just super was, international meeting. It was astounding. Was astounding. Like I went, you know, right away, and there was an 8 a.m. meeting that met five days a week, Monday through Friday, that was 25 minutes walk from the hotel where I was staying. And so I went as often as I could. You know, I went to the meeting twice, then they asked me to speak. You know, I was just like, I met, you know, a woman who lives between L.A. and Paris that knows people in L.A. AA that I know. It was just, it was great. And, you know, I found a woman there. I liked her share. I got her number. I called her when I was in Paris. Um, you know, cause like, you know, life is in session. And so there was a lot of anxiety around work and, you know, other things. So it was nice to have like someone there locally that I could call and talk to kind of like a, you know, like a, a woman attempt sponsor, so to speak, a woman that had, you know, 20 years of sobriety. Well, what it is, is it's like you have a friend. It's like, that's the cool thing about, about 12 step when it works is that like, wherever you go, you have people that are going to be 
your friend, basically. You're, you're, it's like you, you show your card. It's like your diner's club card or whatever. It's funny. You know, it's funny how, like, our fuck-ups, you know, put us into this community. You know, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, and I think... Um, are the I mean, meeting? Are, are they lately, annoying? Like, are, the are, fellowship has been the piece of the program that's been helping me tremendously. Like, just, like, talking to another alcoholic has been really soothing for my crazy mind recently. And, you know, I feel like there's a lot of people, I think, that are very isolated that, you know, I think a 12-step program and the fellowship that it brings could, you know, really benefit them. Like people that I know in my own life who aren't in a 12-step program, I'm like, fuck, I wish they were because, you know, if they had other fellows to talk to, it's just, it really is a game changer. It's a real leap of faith, though. You know what I mean? Like I went to a meeting yesterday. I hadn't been to a meeting in a long time and I went to a meeting that I don't like, that I normally just don't like, but I was in the neighborhood and like my, my morning thing got shifted around. So I went to this meeting and like, I fucking hated it, you know? And, um, and I'm not saying like, don't go to, I, I agree with Aurora. I, I think you should go to 12 step if you feel isolated and you're suffering. But I know, like I've, I've heard from a ton of people in the Dopey Nation, the listeners who like get very uncomfortable going to meetings. And I went to this meeting and I got very uncomfortable. And, and it's, it's funny, like, when you want so badly for it to do something good and it doesn't, you know, do you ever have that experience? Yeah, you know, I think, um, I think the thing I try to keep in mind is, like, impermanence, you know, that I don't, I won't always feel a certain way. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes I go to a meeting and I'm like, I hate this fucking meeting. I feel like I need a meeting after the meeting, you know, that the speaker was shit or my mind was judgmental. But I just try to hold on to the idea that, you know, I'm not always going to feel the same way. So, I mean, you know, sometimes I'm like, sometimes I feel like I have nobody to talk to in AA, you know? I'm like, sometimes I feel like, oh, I don't like any of the women that go to my home group or I don't like you know, there's one woman I'm trying to call that mm, I don't relate to her or I don't like this other woman's suggestion. Um, and other times, especially when I'm in fucking emotional pain, I might talk to somebody and, you know, all of a sudden it's like this lifeline that I'm like latching on to, you know, that their suggestions or their just listening to me is so helpful. So, you know, I think the same thing, like sometimes... I, I just think it's like it, it ebbs and flows, like what works for you or what you find the most relief from. You know, sometimes it's the seeking God. Sometimes it's meditation. Sometimes it's meetings. Right now, for me, it's one alcoholic talking to another. Well, the, the meeting that I went to, it was a, it was a tradition meeting. And the meeting, the meeting was all about the tradition that all meetings be self-supporting, accepting no contributions. That was the whole meeting. And, um, so like, you know, I think they, it was like, it was hard to make that meeting like good. And then the crowd was just so fucking annoying to me. Um, but you're yeah. right. You know, I left, I left that meeting. Like that's a meeting that I leave like incredibly discontent and I should stop going there. Like to that meeting, it bugs me. It always has bugged me that meeting. Um, so I just shouldn't go there. But I think one thing that they did say at that meeting was that one one thing about the meetings being self-supporting or whatever is that you never find the same meeting twice. That it's not like Starbucks, that you could go to a great meeting, a shitty one, a rich one, a poor one, a weird one, you know, whatever. And, and that's true. So it's like if you hate the fucking meeting that you go to, you could find a different one. And I think that's reassuring. Yeah, exactly. It's like, Nobody is trying to sell you anything like you don't have to buy anything in AA that you don't want to or NA or any 12 step. It's like, you know, it's there. It's for free. If you don't like the speaker, maybe the next one you'll see, you'll, you'll like what they have to say and take something from it. Same thing about a meeting. You don't like that meeting. You don't have to go to that fucking meeting, you know? And, and also you don't have to go at all. I mean, do whatever you want. It's just, if you're struggling You know, if you're at the point where you're really struggling and you don't know what to do, like you go to a meeting because it'll help if you take a suggestion. But I don't want this this appearance just to be us pushing fucking 12 step on the dopey nation. Agreed. I have I have a lot of things that I wanted to talk to you about. I've forgotten every one of them. Well, I know that um, Alaska Thunderfuck was a, 
a very, very honest and forthright guest. She was not a sober guest, though. Does that mess with you to have a not sober guest in front of you on Dopey? I mean, I think it was interesting to hear her perspective. Um, and I'm a little judgmental, though. I found like I was having some judgment around her not staying sober. Um, and I also felt like real gratitude that I have stayed sober. What I heard from her was that, you know, when she performs, she does not take any substances or drink any alcohol so she can be her her best. And, you know, I kind of thought, why doesn't she feel that way in the rest of her life? Um, you know, if she knows that she performs soberly the best, like, why doesn't it apply to all areas of her life? Right. Um, well, you know what it makes me think of? I remember when you came home from France, you said to me there were moments that you actually considered uh, having a drink out there. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I so when I first started working, it was like uh, I had a couple weeks where it was like a Monday through Friday schedule. And then when we started filming, it was pretty full on and, you know, I went 10 days without a meeting and I was working like anywhere between 12 to 17 hour days and it was really hot. And there was one day when I thought like I could probably have a drink and then I, that was probably like eight days no meeting. And I was like, Oh my God, that's a crazy fucking thought. I was like, I better get to a meeting. But you're so, Um, I mean, you're so 12 stepped out. Like what is that thought even like? Like, how does that, how does that happen? Like how close from a thought to an action is it? Mm, You know, that's the, that's the million dollar question, right? I mean, I, I I don't know, but I thought like, as soon as I had the thought, I thought that's a crazy thought and you better get to a meeting. Um, The other thing, the other thing that she reminds me of, and this is kind of stupid, but it's just, it just is. That, uh, you know, we talk about it during the interview that Alaska Thunderfuck is this uh, classic marijuana strain. And uh, and I know, you know, my my dear friend Aurora was a ridiculous stoner just like I was. I mean, me and Aurora smoked so much pot together. And it makes me think about in L.A., it's recreationally uh, legal. Like, that doesn't fuck with you? You go to Paris and you're like, I could have a drink, but you're walking down the street and there's dispensaries everywhere? I was in Venice over the weekend and I got this, you know, ridiculously big waffle cone at this ice cream place. And across the street is like a massive uh, marijuana shop. And there was a, a line out the door. And I just thought, you know... Part of me like felt a little twinge of nostalgia of like, oh shit, how easy would it be to just walk in there and buy some bud right now? I know. You know, I had I had that thought too. I mean, I just try, you know, I try not to be too judgmental about the thoughts. Um, I try to share openly about them. But Aurora, and- isn't that the craziest thing? Like, it's you, right? And you could walk into the store and buy some bud. It's just like, it's bizarre. Is that not bizarre? It's bizarre. It's bizarre. And then I have to sometimes, you know, I just remind myself like, you did that for 23 years. You had that life. You know, this is a new life. Exactly. And, and I- exactly. You know, that's something that my, my sponsor actually says. He says that every morning he wakes up and he has to remind himself that the old him is dead. That's something he says every day. Yeah. Um, you know what else it reminds me of? When you used to come over and we would, we would, we would predict New York legalization and how you and me were going to open our own dispensary. Yes. And- we spent a lot of time like talking about that, fantasizing about that. Like I was like, yeah, I had a very clear vision of like, I wanted some like, very high end, um, modern, like architecture, West village kind of boutique bud spot. I saw it with very clean wood, really woody, but light yeah. and clean, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. like a, like a, you know, Swedish design or something. Yeah. We talked about that a lot. I pictured a lot of like plants, a very like curated menu. And then also some like, you know, nice coffees, smoothies, et cetera, like esoteric fucking, 
tinctures of teas and, you know, kombuchas and bullshit. Yeah. All that stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was, that's just crazy. You know what I've gotten into, like I've become addicted to or I've become habitually drinking these things is the what? banana peanut butter almond milk smoothie. I get it like every day. Uh, they're delicious. I, There's I, nothing better. I mean, if I had to choose one food to eat, it would be peanut butter. I was at work. I was at work and I was working and like, you remember that smoothie place that was near my house uh, downtown on Grand Street? That place that I was like, this is the best smoothie place ever. Yes. They, they turned it into a chain. I always wanted to invest in that place. They turned it into a chain and they have one near my dad's house and they have one near my job. And the guy's like, well, what kind of smoothie do you want to get? And I was so stupid. I, I was like in the middle of a shift, you know, and I said, I said, either get me. There are two smoothies I like to get. One is the banana almond milk peanut butter. And the other is the pineapple mango banana. OK, mm-hmm. so I said, so this is how stupid I am. I said, either get me the banana peanut butter almond milk or the pineapple mango banana. You decide, I say, right? Right. To this Dominican kid. I say, you, d- you pick my smoothie because I'm such a fucking idiot that I can't pick it. So he goes and he comes back and he gives me a smoothie. And you know what it was? Pineapple. No, it was peanut butter, banana, strawberry. Ah, uh, that could work. Did you ever hear me work. mention strawberry in any of those drinks, though? No, but you gave him liberty to, like, make decisions, so... I got so upset, right? I got so (laughs) upset and so angry. And then I took a sip, and you know what it was? I knew knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that you got so fucking angry before you even tried it, and then I'm sure you tried it, and you were like, oh, my God, I love this. pretty good. (laughs) And I gave it to Fanny, and she goes, oh, she goes, oh, that's not so good. And then she said, then she said, actually, that's pretty good. And what it was, was it was like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich drink. It was crazy. It's like I invented this kid by getting my order wrong, like invented heaven in a smoothie. Yum. Have you ever had, what do you think? Peanut butter, banana, strawberry. That sounds good. Yeah, that sounds all right to me. I'm really into strawberry lately. And I just had for the first time, I bought at the farmer's market these Oxnard strawberries, which I heard were like, you know, so sweet and delicious. And they really fucking are. Oxnard? I'm like obsessed with going to farmer's markets. This, this is, yeah. this is the, the, bougie, the bougie ex-stoner talk. Oxnard yeah. strawberries and farmer's markets. Yeah. Well, yeah. good for you. That's exciting. Um, hold on. You know, I have to say this weekend when I walked by that weed shop and the thought came to me, like, what's to stop me from going in there and buying weed? It it disturbs me. I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with me? I I have, you know, almost four years. Like, why am I thinking these thoughts or like what's wrong with my program or, you know. But you're aren't you isn't like part of the whole thing that you're allowed to think whatever you want. It's not the thoughts. It's it's the action. It's, it's action. but yeah. if I, if I was there, I mean, I would really struggle with that. I mean, I, I I remember the other day, and this is not sobriety. This is just like whatever, and, and this is kind of stupid. But I left the supermarket and I was going to my car, and um, I guess somebody who was just there had taken a drag of a cigarette and then decided they didn't want to smoke it and just dropped it. So it was like a full cigarette burning at the end, you know, like a full Marlboro lying Uh in the parking lot. Like it was like untouched. It was just like a full cigarette that was smoking itself in the parking lot. And I'm just staring at it. And I'm like, I was really considering picking it up and smoking it. Like literally I was, and I know that's not your sobriety or whatever, but it's the same kind of thing, you know? Well, in Paris, all the cigarette smoking really fucking made me angry and crazy. I am like so classically the intolerant ex-smoker until I get into some really stressful situation or high anxiety and then I want to smoke. But I, I was thinking when I had the impulse there to, to take a drink when I thought, oh, I could, I could probably take a drink. 
you know, it was so clear to me how smoking is completely off the table for me. Like it is not an option for me to, to have one drag of a cigarette or I know I will be smoking again. But I was like, why am I, why am I fantasizing about chilled red wine? Why am I thinking that, you know, telling myself that it could be okay to drink? Like, do I need to like really go back to the first step here and like, you know, kind of work on that, like, and, and really know, like, you cannot take one drink, you know, you can't. And, and it is off the table for me. Weed is just somehow different for me. Like, I had such a fantasy that I was going to get to smoke pot my whole life. And like, I love, I just loved all the identity about weed. And like, even just talking about strains, like, I, I think I smoked Alaska Thunderfuck once. You Did you ever smoke Alaska Thunderfuck? I can't remember. I don't think I did. Do you remember any good strains? Like, what were your some of your favorite strains that you got to smoke in your heyday of stonerdom? Well, I mean, there was so much sour diesel, so that was always coming around. And then I can't, I mean, I remember, like, I would always, like, when the lead delivery guy would come and he would have, like, whatever, you know, six, ten different strains, I would, it would always be, like, such a fucking, you know... I would just, what's the word I'm looking for? I would debate forever smelling them, looking at them. Which one has got the most amount of butt in it? And like, which strain should oh, I yeah. be getting? Do you remember like, you and me one? sitting there with that shit? Yes. Like we'd have like, like six we- bags and I'd be like, well, this one has, li- do you get little nuggets or do you get the big butt? Cause I mean, people outside of New York don't know when you buy delivery butt in New York, it's basically a gram for like, how much was a gram? Like 20 bucks, 25 bucks. Yeah, 25 at least. Yeah, and you get a gram. And it and was like, it wasn't it like 50 or 60 bucks for like 2.5 grams? Yeah, it was like 50 for two and a half grams. And you have to sit there and kill yourself if you're getting more butt or more stem or which bag looks heavier and which bag is the killest. Oh, man. Those were the days, right, Rory? And you always wanted the most psychedelic. And I always wanted, like, what's going to get me the most high, but maybe not a pure indica, because I don't want to be, like, totally incapacitated. But I wasn't a person who, like, wanted to, I didn't really need to function on weed. I would always wait to smoke it so I I didn't have to do anything else. So if I just wanted to, you know, sit around like a zombie, I could. I would fool myself. I would usually buy two bags. I would buy the functional bag and then the incapacitating bag. And then we wh- only ever wanted to smoke the incapacitating bud. I know. So like, I don't know why I ever bought the functional bud because it's not like I was, you know what I mean? It never worked out that way. Um, I remember for strains, the OG Kush was always, always delivered the punch and I would get anything that was purple. Yeah. You yeah. know, I, I loved every purple strain and the more purple, the better. Cause as far as I could tell, I could really taste the purpleness. There was one like I can't I can't remember the name, but like one that was kind of fruity and dank that I loved. Well, on that note, we are going to play a voicemail that we just got. And I think she calls herself the Dopey Dane. And um, just listen to the Dopey Dane. She's a weed grower in Northern California. And um, I'm very happy being sober, but uh, I love the dank. I just have to say that even though I'm happy being sober, I'll always love the dank. You, Roy? Uh, yeah, I do. I do. Here's the dopey Dane. Hey, Dave, and hey, Chris. I know you're not with us anymore, but, um, you know, I'd like to think that this kind of reaches you somewhere out in the cosmos, and you are missed for sure. And, uh, Dave, glad that you're going hard still. It's super awesome. I've been listening to Dopey pretty much like the whole summer. You've kept me company through some really hard, long, hot days out in the garden. I uh, live in the mountains of Northern California, and I'm a cannabis farmer. I've been farming dope for like seven years now, and um, I just discovered Dopey, and I really, I really love you guys. You guys like you keep me company. 
And I'm listening to all the past shows along with the newer ones. And I just heard the one where, Dave, you go to um, a pot farm for like a trim scene. And I just thought that was super funny. I've been wanting to, to hit you up for a while and give you a dopey story. So I figured now would be a great time to do it. Yeah, I'm sitting in the middle of this like 80 foot greenhouse with um, 400 plants that are in the third week of flower. They're all this really beautiful uh, double sour ghost. And I'm super fortunate to be able to do this for my living. So anyway, I'm going to hit you with the Adobe. Um, so a few years ago, maybe about four or five years ago, uh, I was farming in the mountains of Santa Cruz. And this is back when it was like a little bit, bit more illegal to... Uh, grow, you're always kind of like lightweight, worried about the cops coming to like cut down your plants or crazy like tweakers in the woods trying to come like rob you, whatnot. You know, there were a bunch of like crazy characters up in those mountains from gun toting vegans to just crazy rednecks. Also, some really, really beautiful characters as well. Um, all types. But um, I, uh, you know, I always kind of did drugs on the mellow, like at dead shows and festivals growing up, you know, did all like the good drugs, like psychedelics and stuff. And I never really did like any of what I would call like the bad drugs, the super addictive drugs like meth or coke. I mean, coke kind of like borderline, but mostly like meth or crack or dope, you know. But it wasn't until I met uh, this one boyfriend and he introduced me to those drugs. So this story is from that time. Um, when I thought it would be cool slash okay to, to try those kind of drugs. So this one night, uh, we were up at my house where I had my garden, my boyfriend and I, and it was kind of in like a rural part of the mountains, but it wasn't like too deep. Um, it was like, you could still get to a neighbor's house, you know, through the woods. It was on like maybe like seven acres or something, the property. And we were up there and, um, we decided to like smoke a bunch of meth. And at first, you know, it's like super, super fun. And I always thought it kind of felt like you were like rolling super hard. Um, but you know, when that kind of like runs its course and then the psychosis sets in and I just, you know, I was like so typical, such a typical like meth psychosis, which is like you see fucking people in the woods wearing ghillie suits or in camo or whatever. And so I just thought that there were these people in the woods like surrounding the property and it was February. So there weren't even plants in the ground, which is like hilarious because like, you know, what would they be? there for is literally like raining there's like california winter you know there's no fucking weed there anyway shows you uh what drugs can make you think <laughs> but um my boyfriend was a little bit more of like a seasoned meth user he knew that there wasn't anybody there but there was no convincing me and so i was just like bushwhacking basically like through the woods to try to like find these motherfuckers that were like out there and just kind of like scurrying away from me at every chance i get and after a while he was just like yo when you're ready just come inside and he comes out to inside and he hands me this machete and he's like come back when you're like done you know because he knew like i was so i was like all right well i fucking got my machete and i'm gonna get these motherfuckers and i just am like bushwhacking through the woods i start like seeing all the tan oak leaves start looking like these little naked girls that are like taunting me i'm a painter too and i like paint these paintings of sort of like naked chicks with like giant watermelons like in the woods sort of this like um there's sort of like mysterious like erotic and also innocent at the same time and i thought that they whoever they were were like hanging these hanging these like ladies in the in the woods to like get me to to come closer and like try and catch them and there were all these women everywhere just like everywhere i kept seeing them it was so fucking annoying so finally i kind of like give up and now i'm at the edge of the property like back down like sort of on my the edge of my neighbor's property and it's just starting to get light out so i'm like oh fuck i'm just starting to like kind of realize that like i'm a losing it 
it. And I fucking go out. I decide I'm going to, like, make this loop onto my road and then, like, walk back up. But I'm still, like, seeing these dudes in camo now, you know? And I'm, like, talking to them about how I don't even know what they're doing there because it's fucking February and I don't have any plants in the ground. And I'm just, like, so annoyed with them at this point. I'm annoyed with myself because I, like, half know that they're, like, not there. So finally, I, like, have my machete and I'm, like, walking on the road. And I circle back up to my house and my landlord lives like actually over the on the same property, just like over the fence kind of. But I decide that I'm going to go wake him up and tell him about these motherfuckers surrounding the property because I'm pissed and they shouldn't be there. And he's this like adorable, like darling Israeli man who's just like a super hippie. And so I go, and he's so sweet, but I wake him up. This is, like, probably, like, 7 in the morning, and I wake him up, and I'm like, there's all these people. Like, I don't even know what they're doing here. And he's like, oh, he's so sweet. He's like, oh, beautiful. Where are the people? Show me the people, please. Show me where, where. And he, like, gets up, and I'm, like, looking all around, trying to, like, show him. And he's like, oh. And he's, like, a total tripper, so, like, I feel like he kind of thought I was, like, probably spun on acid or something. And he was like, you know, I don't see them. I wish I see. I wish I see what you see. Like, he'll fucking take mushrooms or acid, like, at any at any time of day, pretty much. So he just probably thought I was tripping. And there's this other chick staying with him. Her name was, like, White Fawn or something. And she was like, whoa, this bitch is, like, losing it, probably. But they were really sweet. And they were like, yeah, you know, like, go to bed. And I, was like, felt defeated, kind of. And I just kind of like roll back to my house with my machete and I think I was wearing this like fur coat because you know like why not it was kind of chilly and then I just went inside and stared out the window for a while kind of let myself down a little bit (laughs) and finally I think I like ate a Xanax and went to bed but I don't know pretty typical meth story I feel like I would always like hallucinate like little fairy things like in the woods you know and it was like cool and fun but it was also like not cool and not fun anyway that was kind of long um what should I say my name is let's say my name is my name is the dopey dane because I got three great danes so that'll be my name on this the dopey dane and thanks dave i love what you do stay strong dopey nation and minase toodles all right thank you dopey dane i fucking love this voicemail i love your voice i love that you're in northern california growing the double sour ghost uh i love the the tweaker story this is a good a good voicemail for you guys because like Dopey Nation, send in funny fucking dopey stories. It keeps the Dopey Nation alive and free. Just send in a voicemail to uh, dopeypodcast at gmail.com. Aurora, didn't it remind you of being young? Yeah, it did, it did remind me of being young. And the bo- and I love like her description of the landlord. And I love how her boyfriend was like, you know, here you go. Like, I'll, I'll, see, you, I'll see you in the morning. Like, go ahead. I like, love how you, she described you- him as a seasoned meth smoker. Yeah, yeah. He was like, yeah, I know this bullshit. Uh, I'm going, I'll see you later. I'm going to bed. So I, I love that. And I, I want to thank her for sending that in. I think with, um, you know, I always, I, I have a reservation with Bud. You know, I, I do not plan on smoking it. And I don't know, like, I don't know that I will. And I, but I don't know that I won't. I have a reservation with weed. Um, you know, it's funny I don't know in what context it was, but I was thinking about, you know, when my children have children, right? And like being a grandparent. Oh, I was watching The Sopranos. That's what it was. I was watching The Sopranos and, uh, and Tony's mother dies. But when Tony, I know you've never watched it, but I'll just lay the scene out for you. When Tony's mother uh, is dying, it was like the last scene, because the actress actually died too. And it was the last scene they actually shot with her. And Tony says to his mother, you never filled out these memory books for my kids. And Carmela's mother wrote out all of her memories and you didn't do any of it. And then I imagined writing out my memories for Nora's kids or Susan's kids. And um, and like what a crazy thought that is. And then I imagined um, being an old man who smokes weed, you know, like 
do I write it out? That I don't know. Like it was a weird moment. But it, what it really made me think is that I should stay sober because uh, of my grandkids if I have them. Yeah, totally. And you should stay sober for yourself too. I mean, you know, that's the most important thing is like what kind of life do you want to have. And yeah, but don't you miss those stormy days? Humidity is rising. A few lightning bolts in the air, and you ice up the old bong. Get it? Get going. Yeah, I know that. Um, I mean, even lately, I've been having fantasies, uh, like when I'm not working, about like just shutting the blinds and making it dark in the apartment and just fucking isolating and watching like marathon, you know, television. But I know I'm I'm gonna feel like shit if I do that. And I know that actually like watching one or two or three episodes of something like binging that is fine and will do the trick. Will give me that feeling that I, I'm looking for that I, this fantasy that I have that like isolating in, in a dark apartment is going to like, you know, be something that is a fix for me. I know that's a lie. It's not right. Right. And it takes me back to that story with the cigarette. The reason I didn't pick up the cigarette and smoke it is because you know, it, it's the one, it's really, my whole recovery and my whole program, if you want to call it a program, is based on this. That if I smoke a cigarette, it's like, it's nothing. I need to constantly be smoking. And, uh, and it's the same thing with weed. If I ice up the bong, it's not like going to be an afternoon. And if it's only one afternoon, that's not nearly good enough. It needs to be constant. It needs to be total. And there is no life that way, you know? Yeah. And I mean, you've been saying all along since the beginning of when you got sober that you have this like fantasy that one day you can smoke weed again or that if such and such thing happens to you, then that'll be the excuse you need to, to use again. And I, you know, I hope that changes for you. Wow. That, 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 that stings of patronization there, Rory. <laughs> why no, you why I'm you be patronizing me? I'm not patronizing you. I hope I'm one day stand, it. Ch- I hope it you know, changes. It's also scary when you hang on to that stuff. You know that, dude. You were just in fucking, it's just, dude. It's the, same thing, it's the same thing that we were just talking about with the first step. Like that, it is an option for you. That smoking weed is not off the table for you, and it has to be. Like dude. you have to fucking take that stuff away it can no using can no longer be an option it's not an option you're the one who was just in fucking france daydreaming about chilled red wine don't fucking be <laughs> don't be patronizing me i'm not, I'm not gonna say you can't have chilled red wine aurora it's like these are thoughts addicts have thoughts you know i'm a stoner i can i, I agree with you I, I, you can, we can have all the thoughts we want as long as we don't act on those thoughts Exactly. I mean, like, what's the difference between a chilled bong and a chilled red wine? Why, why you, you get so mm-hmm. so upset about my chilled bong hits when you're fantasizing about smoking parliaments and sipping on chilled red wine? Both sound good. All right. Bong hits and red wine. But I never fucking actually I did smoke parliaments, but I hate parliaments. Are you kidding me? If I was going to smoke, it'd be a pack of American spirit yellows. I don't like those. Mm, I love those. You know, I, even, I I found even that the, even the orange, even the light ones. I, I I when I smoked American Spirits, I smoked the green ones or the turquoise ones. But like, I yeah, found that red. I found that I didn't like how they tasted, and I hated how they burned. It would be like sucking a, a milkshake up through a McDonald's straw. It was so thick. <laughs> Oh man! You know what I'm talking about. You know, you know that McDonald's shake that you, just doesn't come fast enough. Yeah, I do know what you're talking about. I'm I'm totally thinking about um, what's his name, Chris Heron, who was on the show a couple weeks ago. Like when I listened to him talk about recovery, and at the end of that, like when he was talking about like how we stay sober for, you know, the people that didn't make it, you know, and how we try to live our best lives soberly, you know, for me, it's in part of like breaking the cycle of my family, of my parents' addiction and that like innate knowledge of like knowing that I can only have the best life that I can have by staying sober. Like that is what that was like brought me back to center. Like when I came back from Paris and I was kind of beating myself up, like, why are you having these thoughts about drinking? You know, like that kind of 
really refocused my, my efforts of like, oh yeah, this is why I am sober. You know, I get to like have the life my mother never could have had. And I get to, I get to hopefully be the happiest that I can be by not drinking or using. Right. Well, your life is, is already like a million, you know, your mother didn't get to have half the life that you've had. You know, exactly. Yeah. So even if I, you know, I would have had a, you know, a decent or great life compared to her anyway, but I just know in my heart of hearts that I can have the best life that I can have if I stay sober. I hear you. And and my life is like, it's incomprehensibly better than it was when I had a chilled bong. You know, it's a joke. Like I'm not, I'm not close to smoking weed. You know that. Um, but yeah. I, but I don't have anything to prove to anybody either just cause I can get nostalgic for the taste of bud or an afternoon with a stormy sky and a bong. But my life is like head and shoulders better than it's ever been like without question. Like it's not even close. And, um, and making the show, the show itself like makes my life so much better. I love making the show makes me so happy. And, uh, and one thing that recently happened with the show is we were taken off of fucking iTunes, and I, like, lost my mind. Um, and, I, and I had to go to war, you know, in my mind with iTunes, which you know I love going to war. I, I, you do. You love, you love a good, a good throwdown. And I, for the first time, I can see the change in me. I actually fucking wrote an email to iTunes. Nice. What did you say? You said, listen, I'm on this podcast, and if you guys don't have it on, <laughs> it's fucking bullshit. I... I'll be drinking my chill red wine with my American spirits yellows. Exactly. No, I said some bullshit like, you know, I I don't know. I just said like, this is very important to me, this podcast. And I would rather listen to it on iTunes than Spotify. And like, you know, this, you know, means everything to my recovery. That's what I said. All right. I love that you wrote iTunes an email. I mean, that's so something that you wouldn't have done. And I so appreciate it. And a ton of members of the audience of the Dopey Nation uh, wrote emails to iTunes and some of them sent me their email and I got one from this guy named Adam and I found it to be very moving. Uh, did you think it was moving, Rory? Yeah, I did think it was moving. Would you read it? Would you? a lot of emails like this. Yeah, but th- I don't know. This one, it, it touched me. R- read it, please. Hey, Dave. I'm watching a super shitty movie so I thought I'd take the time to help you out as your show has certainly helped me. The iTunes comment box had a limit, so I had to edit this way down, but below is the original and the edited message. I really enjoy your show, and I wish you the best of luck in getting it back on iTunes. Take care, Adam. I should also say that I'm sorry for the loss of your good friends. You don't know me from Adam, but as a listener, I can say that your love for Todd and Chris was and is palpable. So his message on iTunes was... I first learned a dopey on This American Life. If Ira Glass thinks highly enough of a podcast to feature it, I listen. On the surface, dopey is about addiction, but it is so much more than that. It is about family, friendship, loss, perseverance, laughter, and most importantly, new beginnings. My brother was in need of a new beginning as he was in treatment for alcohol dependency. Dopey ushered me through a difficult time by deepening my understanding of what was go- what he was going through. Storytellers like Dave and Chris are instrumental in shedding the stigma associated with addiction. Only good can come from normalizing these conversations as addiction touches all of us in one way or another. Please bring Dopey back to iTunes. I believe it is helping a lot of people, and I know it helped me. Isn't that great? Uh, yeah, it's especially nice since... Since his brother it was in treatment and it was, you know, helping him to understand where his brother's head was at, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, I just, I don't know, there was just something about, you know, that the show isn't just about uh, drugs, addiction, and dumb shit. It's about family and it's about friends and it's like, that's what the show is about. And I, just the fact that Adam could listen to it and really feel that, and I mean, just when I hear from people in the audience, it's obvious that we get that across. And, um, and I think it's beautiful. And I, I mean, that's one of the reasons that I put you on the show because we're so close. And, um, I mean, we don't get to hang out ever and we barely talk anymore, but (laughs) we're still close. (laughs) But like, the point is like, I know that our friendship can come through the show and it can make people feel a part of it. And I, I think it's important. That's beautiful, Dave. 
Are you are you patronizing me again? <laughs> Um, I miss you. I miss talking to you. But so I'm glad we've connected this week. You know. Yeah, it sounds like you're ready to put in some work for Dopey, right? Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, I, it is true. Wow, you say that with a uh, with a little hesitation because you're you're nervous that I'm questioning your resolve. <laughs> and I'm nervous that I'm going to get a job and then be like unavailable. But well, I, you know, I'll do what I can while I'm not working. Dopey Nation, you heard it here. Aurora plans on pitching in on the back end of the show. Um, do you want to hear a stupid story that happened to me, uh, or do you want to be done? Um, I think that we should get Sam Levinson. That's who I want to try and get is, like, the creator of Euphoria, who is this teenage drug addict. That's what I'm thinking about today. Well, what but, do you – What do you? Well, I mean, have you, you been, wanna... have you been watching Euphoria? I, yeah, I wa- I've only watched two episodes. The first episode was so intense. I watched it with my boyfriend who has a 12-year-old daughter, and he was like, I don't think I can watch this, that I, I, haven't, I haven't watched. But I watched episode two last night, and I love it. I think it's really good. Well, it's a beautifully, it's beautifully made show. And um, like they do a good job with music, and the, the visual quality of the show is pretty amazing. And... Um, I like shows about high school. I like shows about like high school sex and relationships. I like shows about junkies and drug scenes and all that. So I'm enjoying the show personally. I think um, I would love to get Sam Levinson to come on the show. You got to keep watching it so we can really delve into it. A little meaty deep dive. Next week okay. is the um, is the season finale, and I think we're gonna do like a, a review with our professional reviewing friend. Oh, good. All right, good. I want to I wanna hear that. Now, before we go, I want to tell you... Oh, first I'm going to read the iTunes Review of the Week. You ready for the iTunes Review of the Week? Yeah. Now that we're back on iTunes, thank God we can get back to the great iTunes Review of the Week. I'm actually stalling as it pops up. Holy shit, we're not... On, oh, no, we're, hold on. One second. One, everybody, please stand by. My dad hates these parts. Like when I say we're going to do something and then I have to find it. That's my dad's worst favorite part of the show. But you know what his second worst favorite part of the show is? What? When you come on and you say you know a lot. I was just going to say that. I know Alan is going to be so critical. And I've said a lot of you knows. But I'm just not going to I'm not going to overthink it. My dad thinks he's God's gift to podcasting. Well, he gets a lot of love, so I could see, and he's, you know, you guys are related, so the inflated ego, you know, my family. <laughs> he, thinks, he thinks he's the greatest thing on podcasts since fucking Joe Rogan, my dad. And the Dopey Nation gasses him up. I know. I know they do. Anyway, so this... Every, every review I see is like, and I love Alan. Actually, so I'm going to read the newest review, and I'm sure my dad is reading it right now, because I think iTunes coming back really made my dad's life better than anybody else's. But it's actually a one-star review, and it says, Alan who? Can you please get this old Jew off the show? He makes me <laughs> sick. I'm just kidding. It, it's, it's not true. It's not true. It doesn't say that. All right. Newest review. Five-star review. Debauchery. And it's by Beige Young. Dopey podcast is not for any. I'm sorry. I'm going to say that again. Dopey podcast is not for everyone. In fact, the people who would find this podcast depraved are probably the majority of the outstanding moral citizens that have built our civilization. Dopey is for everyone else. Dopey is for those of us that live underneath the buildings and structures our fellow man has built as we use our cunning and manipulation to make a quick buck off the normies and prod our arms with sharp tips or buy flowers at gas stations. I found Dopey accidentally amidst a five-day relapse of blackout fentanyl. Very fitting. I have grown attached to Dave. I have grown attached to Chris, only to be reminded how soul-sucking heroin addiction is. Nobody is immune to the fatality of dope, not even the goofy people-pleaser Chris, who was taken from the dopey nation. Hopefully he is no longer stirring in ADHD or listening to terrible electronic music as he rests in peace. We all miss you, Chris. We all thank you, Dave, for staying strong. For all of us in the dopey nation, all of us degenerate drug addicts, thieves, felons, and alcoholics are proud members of the dopey nation, and I will rep dopey forever. Thank you for bringing genuine light to our worlds of darkness and death. 
Joe Young of Boston. What a great review. Oh, my God. His enthusiasm is contagious. I love it. I know. Everybody, um, thank you, Joe. Fucking great review. Uh, great for, review. Nobody likes reviews more than my dad except Chris. So go on iTunes now that we're back up and leave a review. Um, and follow us on Reddit, Instagram. Actually, people on Reddit keep hurting my feelings. Did you know about that, Rory? No. The Reddit, the Reddit fans are just brutal to me. Are they the ones who are telling you, you you talk about yourself too much? Yeah, they say that. They also say that the show doesn't work without Chris. Well, that's not true, but you do talk about yourself too much. You don't want to hear my crazy story? Every episode, you're like, I grew up in Manhattan and blah, blah, I went to private school. I'm like, we know. I didn't even go to private school. You, you need to check yourself, I think. It's the same. We, we know. You're like, my parents were teachers. I don't, say, I, don't, I, don't, I don't say that on the show. When you do I say that? every fucking episode. What? I'm like, everybody knows who you are, Dave. What about the new listener who doesn't know that I'm from Manhattan? I think maybe every third episode then. Just tone it down. I didn't say it this episode. Maybe I said it to Alaska Thunderfuck. I bet I did. You totally did. I need her to know that I'm cool and I'm from Manhattan. <laughs> Uh, All right. You're like drag queens are so cool. Did I say that? Yes. I did not say that. That doesn't sound like me. Uh, you're, oh, you're, you're the biggest people pleaser I've met since Chris. That's I'm, true. I'm glad I never got you two together. You would have ganged up on me crazy. <laughs> it's a shame that we never got together. Well, what are you gonna do? Um, yeah. I'm not gonna tell I'll you. See him, I'll see him on the other side. So you don't want me to tell you the story? Oh, yeah, tell the story. So I grew up in Manhattan, and my parents were <laughs> teachers, and they didn't want me to take the subway to high school. No. All right. So as you know, I live in the suburbs now, and I have this big backyard, right? Okay. And there's a bunch of trees that have, like, dying limbs. And, um, and I meant to cut them. Uh, I, I meant to, like, trim the, 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 the limbs, but I never did it. And then You were going to trim limbs? You're not qualified to trim limbs. Well, I'm going to tell you the story. So after I found the day that I found out that Chris had died, I like borrowed some trimmer and I like went berserk trimming dead limbs in the backyard. And like there were just piles of of tree limbs everywhere. And then I I like kind of threw them in an alley between the garage and the fence and I didn't think about it again. And then like, but I have a lot of dead limbs in the yard and you're right. I'm not, I should not be qualified to trim dead limbs. Um, and I'm coming home from work and my neighbor, I had a new neighbor and her and her dad are standing outside her uh, house and, uh, he's trimming the tree in front of her house. Only he's not using like the kind of shears that I had. I had like a big, huge pair of scissors that you kind of use both hands to squeeze together. I don't know what you call that thing. He was using, uh, like a chainsaw on a stick. Okay. Like a chainsaw Mm -hmm. that's on a pole. Okay. And um, I was like, wow, that's an amazing tool. I like said that to him like five times, hoping he would say, do you want to borrow it? Um, but he never said that. So I went inside and, and a couple days passed and the neighbor was like, oh, do you want to borrow that tool? And I was like, totally. So I, I take the chainsaw on a stick. And if you don't think I'm qualified to fucking trim limbs, imagine me with a fucking chainsaw no, on a stick. Yeah, no, you should not be operating a chainsaw. So I start uh, operating the chainsaw on a stick and I'm in the yard and I plug it in and it's amazing. I'm just like shearing limbs off trees like a knife through butter. It's like, it's like the biggest fantasy of my life. And, and, I'm, and I'm back at the tree that I was cutting when Chris had died and I'm trimming and I'm trimming and I'm trimming and um, I, I kind of get ambitious and I go for this section of the tree that's a little too thick, right? And fucking the chain falls off the chainsaw. Of course. And, um... Didn't you break another neighbor's, like, power tool that they lent you? Yeah, the rototiller. But I fixed that one, too. (laughs) So, so the chain comes off the chainsaw, and I have no fucking clue how to put a chain back on a chainsaw. And Linda, Linda was, like, not home. And, and she knew I shouldn't have borrowed the tool then, either. And I didn't want her to know that I broke the neighbor's tool. So, like, I grabbed Nora, and I went to town to, um, to get it fixed. And we went to the hardware store, and I showed it to the dude. And the dude's like, yeah, I think I can fix that. 
And he fixes it, and he's like, no charge. And he sees my shirt, and he's like, oh, you work at Katz's. And I was, like, feeling kind of, like, full of myself, and I was like, I'll get you some sandwiches, okay? Nice. Uh-huh. And he's like, cool, whatever. And, um, and then Nora's like, Daddy, you better remember the sandwiches. And I was like, yeah, I'll remember the sandwiches. I'll remember the sandwiches. And, and, and a week went by, and I forgot the sandwiches, and another week went by, and I forget the sandwiches, and, like, and then like a month goes by and, and Nora's like, daddy, you still haven't given him the sandwiches. And I was like, you're right. And we went in there and I was, I told them I was sorry. I didn't give them the sandwiches. And then like five, six weeks go by and I'm like, fuck it. I have to get the sandwiches. Cause in being in 12 step, you don't want to say you're going to do something and not do it, you know? And, and also yeah. just like your little kid is like, you know, she's humiliated that you've been a big shot and said you're going to give them sandwiches and then you don't give them the sandwiches. And they don't forget a thing. Exactly. So I eventually I get a couple sandwiches and I, uh, and I, and I also had also in that six weeks, I never returned the chainsaw on the stick. So I, I just kept it in the garage cause I didn't think my trimming was done. How are you going to borrow somebody's chainsaw for six weeks? Well, she asked me about it, and I said I wasn't done using it. It was her father. She wasn't going to use it. I said, if you need it, let me know. Anyway, so I got her an extra sandwich. And um, so first I returned the chainsaw on the stick, and I gave her a sandwich, and she was happy. And then me and Nora went to town, okay? And we're walking to town, and she's like, oh, the guy's name was Dan. And she's like, oh, Dan's going to be so happy you brought him the sandwiches. And I was like, yeah. I was like, but what if he's not there? And she goes, what do you mean? And I was like, well, what if something happened to Dan and he's not there? And, uh, and she's like, what, you mean Dan died? And I was like, well, that would be the worst case scenario that Dan died. But what if he quit? Or what if he got fired? You know? And Nora got really into this idea. And she's like, she starts listing like the best to worst scenarios. You know, the best being that Dan would be there and be happy. And the worst being that Dan had died. Um, so we get to the hardware store and I was like, I have these sandwiches for Dan. And the guy's like, well, Dan's not here anymore. <laughs> and Nora's face just drops. And I'm like, is he okay? And the guy's like, well, he quit. And I was like, and that was like the third worst scenario. Um, <laughs> but it turned out that this guy knew how to get in touch with Dan. And he says, I'm gonna, I'll take the sandwiches and I'm going to eat them and send a picture of me eating them to Dan. And I was like, I was like, no, then don't take the sandwiches because I promised I would get them to him. And the guy said, you have my word. I will get him the sandwiches. So I asked Nora if that was okay with her, and she said, yeah. So we left them the sandwiches, and we left. But isn't that an interesting kind of 12-step story? I, it made me think about this guy in Paris that I heard um, share who, uh, you know, he said, like, as an alcoholic addict, like, his go-to is always, like, the worst thing, like, right? Like, Dan has died. But his wife always says to him, what's the best thing that could happen? What's the best thing that could happen? And it's just, it's like, I never think that way. I'm always thinking, like, what's the worst case? Like, impending doom, right? Right, me too. I mean, it's really, though... The addict thing is to think of the absolute best or the absolute worst. Yeah. Did exactly. you like, did you like, are you happy you heard this story or no? Yeah, I, I like it. It's, I mean, I, I think that you've shown a lot of growth. I can't believe you're doing all this like yard work. Um, I, I just think you're such a grown up now. Um, and you know, and then at the same time, you know, you're such a fuck up still that you've got somebody <laughs> like <laughs> chainsaw for six weeks. And, I know, I know. I know, but I got it done. I returned the chainsaw. They got a sandwich. Dan got his shit. I just pulled a gigantic zucchini out of the garden. So, like, we're doing good. Good. So, good. on that note, we'll say, uh, you know, do all those things, those social media things, and stay strong, Dopey Nation. And, Rory, why you don't you, you say goodbye? All right. Bye, Dopey Nation. Bye, Dave. And uh, toodles for Chris. Yeah. Stay strong, Dopey Nation. Oh, that was the other thing. My favorite thing about that girl's fucking voicemail is she says, Minase toodles. Did you hear that? Oh, <laughs> that's funny. I missed that. At the end, she said, Minase toodles. And that was my favorite thing. And now I have to say toodles. I can't say Minase toodles. So, Why can't you say me nasty toodles? Because I have to say fucking toodles for Chris. 
<laughs> because Chris fucking died, you know? So, but my, my heart is always saying, me not say toodles. That's funny. When did you say that on one of the like earlier recordings? Yeah, yeah. Like Chris went to Jamaica and I, I just did my stupid like, boy, who them say, you know, my dumb Jamaican <laughs> accent. Yeah. And, and then at the end, he's like, toodles. And I'm like, me not say toodles. Um, I love that. Yeah, those are the good old days. And then, and then I, ha- it, it doesn't matter. Anyway, stay strong, Dopey Nation, and fucking toodles for Chris. I want to be good so bad. I want to be good so bad, so bad. I want to be good. Oh, this all ever had, this all ever had, this all ever had. I want to be good so bad, so, so, so bad, blah, 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 blah. I want to be good so bad, blah, 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 blah. I want to be good so bad, blah, 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 blah. I want to be good so bad, blah, 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 bl